Today's guest is an internationally recognized expert on sound healing. He has received praise from numerous for his uncanny abilities in sound healing and vocal toning. He has been a keynote speaker at expos and conferences all over the world. He was given the ability to heal others through his sound in his near-death experience. His NDE story has now been viewed by over 1 million people worldwide. It's often considered one of the best NDE experiences out there. He currently lives in Asheville, North Carolina area. Let's welcome today's guest, Mark Patterson. Welcome, Mark. Adam, thank you. Thanks so much for having me on the show. It's a okay. pleasure to be here. We finally have a connection here. All right, right. Um, very interesting. Uh, we, we discussed a little bit the last time, but obviously just revamping and going a little bit back regarding our ability to grow up in a certain environment and be, you know, uh, in, in, in ingrained in a certain way of thinking, you know, religiously and having a specific doctrine to follow. But many times the people that we are raised by don't really follow that specific type of protocol. It becomes just something that's that's forced into place. Uh, maybe you could just share a little bit about your background, if, if you know, in terms of the way you were raised and. and yeah, and sure. So uh, I was a latchkey kid from Iowa. And um, I was raised by a single mom who worked uh, two jobs and. I always knew things about people. I always had an intuition. I always saw lights and auras around people. I had countless encounters with ETs, angels, um, the unseen dimensions. And of course, uh, when you grow up um, in the environment that you do, as you were just talking about, I was told uh, I was crazy. I was ridiculed. I was teased. Uh, I was told I was always told, don't talk about that. Don't know. Why do you know that? How do you know that? Don't repeat that. You shouldn't know that. Don't say that. And so it becomes very confusing. And my father was a holy roller. He was a Jesus zealot. And he always loved to tell me that I was possessed by the devil. So you unfortunately learn not to trust yourself. Or it becomes really confusing. You learn that maybe there's something wrong with me. You know, maybe there is something wrong. Maybe I, maybe I am crazy, you know? And so Adam to not feel, not to see uh, by the time, not to just, I didn't want to feel anymore. I didn't want to know it anymore. So by the time I was 12 or 13, um, I started doing drugs and alcohol, hard, hard alcohol, not just, you know, like beer or wine coolers, you know, <clears throat> Bartles and James, we thank you for your support back back in the 80s and I was doing hard alcohol by the time I was 13 and um, that accumulated into being at a high school party at the age of 16 uh, where I chugged a fifth of vodka four beers two glasses of wine and four uh, of those wine coolers in about 90 minutes and my body went into cardiac arrest and I had a, a pretty profound uh, near-death experience yeah that's uh, that's obviously I've been I discussed the, the topic and, and getting back to that specific aspect of your life. Uh, I guess we all face some aspect of rejection from our parents in terms of, you know, using them as the motivation or the friction to actually expand ourselves. But some people uh, awaken, some people either get hit with a feather or some people get hit with a brick in terms of needing to change. Um, and you've you had a near that near death experience that was a profound one, and uh, maybe you can just touch upon what exactly took place after after that incident. Yeah, so um, you know, at the high school party, my body lied unconscious in the bathroom of the uh, Canterbury Inn in Corville, Iowa, Canterbury Inn and Suites. And the, anyone who's had a near death experience will tell you that when you first leave your body, it's scary. Because all of a sudden you see your body down there and you're you're aware that you're not in your body anymore. And of course, I'm trying to call out to my classmates and my older classmates who had just, you know, you know, a couple hours earlier were going, go, 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 chug, 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 chug. And of course, Adam, they don't hear you. You know, your cries fall upon uh, deaf ears. And then I was greeted by my grandfather, Russell. Uh, Russell... He was a wheeler dealer bootlegger and uh he he called he always called me uh marcus aurelius and i have he passed away probably when i was around three and i do i still have vague memories of him 
And but that's how I knew I, I, I recognized him. And when he called me Marcus Aurelius, I knew who it was. And he said, you're going home now. So at that moment, you know, I was under the impression that I screwed up, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going on, you know, going on to the afterlife. And they, they, then, the, you know, they think about going into the light, I went into the light. And, uh, and again, this is all multidimensional simultaneous experiences going on. So he's guided me to this uh, place that I've described since 1997 as the city of the clouds, like you saw in the movie, The Empire Strikes Back. I mean, that's the only way I can really describe what I experienced. And uh, there were about seven angels. They were 14 feet tall each. They were female in appearance. And they they showed me my life. Anyone who's had a near the experience or had a, like a, a really bad car accident, they talk about that life flashing before your eyes. It's kind of like a life review and, and you always review your life and what you learned, what you accomplished, you know, while you're here on earth. Right, right. And um, anytime I was angry, resentful, or blamed other people, and then that's all that we ever do when we're teenagers, uh, they asked, how does that relate to love? And everything in life becomes an opportunity to express love. You know, no matter what happens to you, that's what forgiveness means for giving your love away, no matter what happens. If you're always out getting things, you know, getting the car, the house, the relationships, the Rolex watch, whatever it may be, you are forgetting who you really are. And um, so then they introduced me to a being that was about 30 feet tall, that was um, male in appearance, that had much love and compassion, had a great understanding of me, my life, what I was going through, who I was. And then, uh, and then that 30, and then they talked to me about sound, healing through sound, about healing through sound, uh, sacred geometry, all, all the, the flower of life pattern, all that stuff, uh, the platonic solids. And then they talked to me, they talked to me specifically, Adam, about the Melchizedek priesthood and the caste system. The Bible says, and Jesus is like Melchizedek, and thou for all shall always be a priest of Melchizedek. And that 30 foot being formed an icosahedron and entered my heart area and brought me back to life the mark my unconscious body back to life yeah. so in new age terms i'm a walk-in <laughs> yeah i got a new soul i got a new soul yeah it's, it's interesting what you sometimes i always ask the question to myself why do certain people experience the near-death experience as opposed to others who obviously then pass on um from from something i mean you you most of the people, like you said, leave their body. They they gravitate. Their soul gravitates above the body, and they see. You could actually see it. Um, so you know it shows the difference between the brain and consciousness. You know, being universal and connected to the entire universe itself. Um, how long did it take you to assimilate that that experience into your life, where you were able to then share it and speak about it? <laughs> Well, Im immediately it took three or four days because three or four days after my uh, my alcohol poisoning from that party that night, uh, I really didn't know where I was at. I really didn't know anyone. I kind of knew that was my mom, but Adam, everyone looked like they were like this big. They looked really small to me. And I, I was trying to figure out who I was and where I was at. And then by about the fourth or fifth day, I, I remembered I was Mark. I was a sophomore at uh, West High School in Iowa City, Iowa. Um, that was my mom and, you know, I had friends and, you know, things like that. But it, it took it took three or four days just to process, you know, the energetic exchange. The thing I knew that in my dreams for the, those, my dreams were just so vivid. The three or four days after <clears throat> my near the experience, I just kept hitting the message. You're going to be okay. It's, you'll be, it'll, you, it'll fall into place here soon. And by the fifth fourth fifth day it, it, it fell into place now interesting note uh i did not talk about what happened to me because right. i was like did that really happen was that real you know did i was that what i experienced a lot of questions about it and i think i told my best friend dean who's still in iowa city iowa and the girl that i was dating um at, at the time kirsten and then it was about 10 years after my near-death experience 
And I got a phone call at 1.30 in the morning from a woman I never met, never spoke with before. I really don't know how she got my number. There's some theories out there about how, you know. And she went on, she called me. I'll say her name was Deb. And uh, she described my near-death experience verbatim, everything. Everything about the 30-foot being, sacred geometry, sound, that I had this gift through sound that was given to me. And um, then she described, see, Adam, as a child, I used to dream over and over again that everything I wanted was inside my bedroom closet. Like feeling love, feeling like I was belonged. Uh, I didn't go to Disneyland until I was 37. I dream about Disneyland, Winnie the Pooh, Tigger. All those things were inside my bedroom closet. Well, you know, 40 some years later, you figure out that being inside the bedroom closet was that everything that's within, everything that you want is already within the closet of your own heart. Well, Adam, Deb described that dream verbatim okay. to me. And she, I mean, she just knew, she knew everything. And then it was about, uh, I want to say six months, seven months after that, we we met in person. Uh, she, she's a real person. We met, um, but I, I have not heard from her since 1999. I, I have no idea what happened to her. Wow. Very interesting. Yeah. You know, you, uh, you had this experience and many people who have these experiences come back with, with a special gift or a special uh, intuitive or psychic or mediumship type of connection or, you know, a connection to the galactic uh, universe itself. What was the most profound experience, not the most profound experience, but the most profound tool or uh, gift that you received from, from this? Oh, well, I, unfortunately or fortunately, it made me more psychic. I mean, I was already psychic as a kid, but this made me uh, really intuitive. In fact, um, uh, shortly after my near, near experience, I was with my friend Peter up in uh, Door, uh, Door County, Surgeon Bay, Wisconsin, and one morning I woke up and I went to uh, Peter's mom and said, um, you have to call your daughter right now and tell her not to come up. And they looked at me like I, I was crazy, you know. And, and then, you know, later that day I said, look, you really need to tell your daughter not to come up. And and then that, that night after dinner, I just was like, call her now. She cannot be up here. Right. And um, Adam, um, they thought I was crazy. I really upset them. Uh, they sent me back home on the Greyhound bus back to Iowa the next morning. Uh, and unfortunately, the, their daughter, uh, Peter's sister, was uh, killed in the car accident on the way up. And so, again, I said, this is crap. I don't want to deal with this stuff. So I I didn't drink, but I, I, I smoked marijuana, hash. I did something every day just because it made me so, so sensitive. Yeah. It's interesting the sensitivities that people have. I know myself, for example, as a child, I had an intuitive uh, insight as well into what was going on, and I had this deep interest of questioning. Um, right. Yeah. yeah. And to which to which my parents said, "You're very difficult, and you were, you know, a very difficult child." Hmm. Uh, which was, in other words, be quiet and don't ask too many questions. Right. Um, as it as it appears now, in in terms of your near death experience being such a profound one. What would you say the basic reason of having that experience was for? Well, to do what we're doing right now. Um, and also, I spoke at I spoke at expos and conferences all over the world from, well, I, I spoke at Unity Churches, religious science churches from like 97 to 2002, then 2002 to 2016, 2017, somewhere around there. I, I did expos and conferences all over talking about what happened to me. And then since May of last year, there seems to be a lot of interest in what happened to me you know, 38 years ago, but to let people know that, you know, God, whatever you, Jehovah, Yahweh, Alibaba, Sai Baba, whatever you call it, it's within you right now today. And you don't have to die in order to experience it. You know, you are, you are source energy. You are it, you know, and, and, and you know, Jesus said the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God is within you, you know, but so much of a, religion teach you that your reward is in the afterlife but god is right here right now today and that you are eternal and like the course in miracle says nothing eternal can nothing eternal can ever be threatened and so um i just you know the, the, the power presence of love forgiveness whatever you want to call it is that 
it's within you right now today. And it seems to be divine timing. As you know, um, Adam, in uh, Greek mythology, there's chronos, which is chronological time. And then there's kernos, which is God's time. So this message seems to be resonating with more and more people than it did. It surely didn't resonate with anyone when I was a teenager. Right, no one right. would talk about it when I was a teenager, you know. <laughs> And it, it, it wasn't until that phone call 10 years later that I decided, you know, I had a, a profound message, you know, to get out. And but uh, so that seems to be resonating with people more so than it did at any point in time. Also, because of the Internet, you can reach a much more wider span of people than, you know, going to expos and conferences where you might have a few hundred people in front of you. So but, but the other thing is because um, I get this. I've asked Vanessa this over and over again. Why do bad things happen to good people? No one asked me that question. That is the most often question I get. Well, you know, if God is so loving, why do bad things happen to good people? You know, I had, I was violated when I was seven. You know, bad things happen to people. It's the reality of this planet. Um, because you wanted someone to forgive. You wanted someone to love. You want, you said that this time my soul would show love. Right. I would show the power of love. There's a story of the woman in the Congo in Rwanda, Immaculee, who was forced to live in a bathroom for 91 days to avoid being killed or tortured in the Civil War. And, um, you know, after, after all the dust settled, uh, she was, they found the main perpetrator, the one that had killed her family. And she was like the only remaining survivor of her family. And they literally gave her like a baseball bat and machete and said, hey, you know, go at it, do whatever you want to with this guy, kill him, you know, we'll look the other way. And Adam, she found a way to profoundly forgive him and express love towards him. I mean, it's been on TV. She was on Oprah many, many years ago. It's one of the most moving stories, but she understood the assignment. You know, that's what, I mean, she got an A++. And I, I know that's easier said than done, but, you know, that's, and, and that's, of course, the quote, the story of the crucifixion that Jesus loved so much that he was willing to, to express love no matter what happened to him. And that's what we're here for. You know, no matter what happened to you, you're here to express love. And, um, you know, I, I mean, that, I mean, I think it's what Jesus said. I think it's what Buddha said. I think that's what Krishna said. I think they all talked about the real power is the power of, of love. You know, most of us view surrendering this weakness you know, surrendering this great strength you know are you surrendering surrendering to what the universe the one song wants to do through you as you yeah you know, this is how god experiences life is through you you're it i mean michael beckwith a few years ago came out a book called you are the answer i've been telling people that since 1997 you know so yeah when i think when people step out of a victim mindset and they they, they come to a place of knowing that there is a lesson to be learned and there's something to proceed and, and, and follow through with. Um, I think then we, we, we know the, the significance of the experiences you had and the experiences that people have to a lesser extent. Um, I guess, obviously, a person doesn't have to have an NDE to, in order to have a spiritual breakthrough. Um, I could speak for myself. I've had work done, you know, healing work done for myself, as well as past life regression and past life memories that we, that I, I can recall that came into this level, into this, 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 this existence for myself as a soul. Uh, and I know for yourself going through this experience, I was just thinking of the fact that at what point did it concrete itself or to make sense to you, all the things that you're saying now, I mean, how many years did you come to these conclusions, these breakthroughs to say, aha, uh -huh. well, what was the aha moment for you? It was the phone call at one three in the morning for the woman I never met, never spoke with before. Then it was like, it, then it, the, the experience became valid. And then the more I started going out and speaking in front of people, starting at, you know, religious science churches and unity churches, then doing all the mind and body spirit expos, the whole life expos, the new earth expos, all the, you know, and you all of a sudden start attracting people into your life that have the same ex thoughts, same experiences, and you realize um, it's valid. But we we get into trouble because we constantly seek validation from out from things outside of ourselves. Yeah, that's where we get into trouble. Um, on the subject of sound, this 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 morning, for example, I mean, I listen to frequencies. Certain frequencies uh, test test my energy field, which I can feel. Uh, right. 
and certain ones are, you know, resonating smoothly and some are vibrating and creating a little tension in my, in my body, in my energy body. Um, maybe you could discuss how you came upon the exact, you know, information from the sound healing and, and how it helps and assists people and, and what you do with that. So sure. Uh, so the sound healing kind of came through me because around the same time, um, uh, Deb called me. I was down in Charleston. We were doing a <clears throat> Reiki clinic. We were at a Reiki circle at the Unity Church on Leeds Avenue in North Charleston. And um, we were doing just playing around with sound and frequency. And then one day this pure tone just came through me, uh, kind of similar to what um, Deb had talked to me about what happened. And this pure tone, like a singing bowl, like a crystal singing bowl came through me and I just started doing it and anatomy noticed that um, that sound created the sound stillness. I mean, it just basically whatever you were holding on to, you let go of it because the only thing you could focus on was that tone. And then uh, the first time I, I did it in front of people was at the um, uh, Mastering Life Center in Las Cruces, New Mexico in uh, August of 97, where I had about 200 people in front of me. And I talked about my, it was the first time I actually openly talked about my near, near death experience, you know, 10, 11 years after the whole thing. And after about 10 or 15 minutes, I had this voice come to me and say, stop what you're doing and look up. And uh, over half the people were out, just like, you know, like a hypnotist goes sleep, you know, they were out. And then you would see the profound effect it had on people. And we observed it didn't matter if there was five people in front of me or 500 people in front of me that sound would go to each individual's person's greatest point of pain. So if you had pain in your lower back and the person next to them had pain in their thigh, the person behind them had pain in, in their neck, the sound, the pure tone that came through me would go to each individual's, each individual's greatest point of pain and break it up. And, we, and it would just create stillness. I mean, just because we get so busy with the internet, the PDAs, um, tablets, must go here, must go there, must do this, must do that, that we forget to be still. And that's when we learn to be still is where we receive insight, reflection, wisdom, and the body needs stillness to heal. You know, there's an article that just came out uh, from the New York Times about the FDA has approved sound waves uh, for treating um, liver cancer. Really? I've been, I've been talking about sound waves for almost 30 years now you know the word universe means one song the word person is greek for persona through sound um the hopi anastasi adam would sing to their crops because they believe that the singing well singing to the crops produced kernels of kernels of corn the size of most men's thumbs in the book the celestine prophecy it talks about singing to your plants to make them grow um, now, Dan Carlson, who was a farmer in Wisconsin, he became interested in RIPE technology. RIPE technology is the idea of using sound waves to break up gallstones or kidney stones, or in this case, his wife had a, a cancerous tumor. You know, it's just like you, you, a sound wave is a pure tone, a tumor is a dense vibration. So what it does is it hits the right frequency, it breaks it up. It's like they use sound waves to break up gallstones and kidney stones. Well, Dan found that when he ran a uh, 5,000 hertz frequency through his, when he ran a 5,000 hertz frequency through his field, that is the yield was 4, 400% greater. I didn't say 30 or 40% greater, a 400% greater yield running a 5,000 hertz sound wave through the fields. Happened time and time again. And then um, he became fascinated with uh, frequencies and sounds out in nature. Well, Adam, he found that when birds sing in the morning, when they chirp in the morning, they are singing at 5,000 hertz. They're literally singing life into the planet every single morning. Crickets chirp at 2,000 hertz cycles per second. They're literally closing everything down. Um, and there's, you know, the different waves of the brain. There's alpha, delta, theta, beta. And then, you know, the other thing they found out was sound with Hans Jenna and cymatics. Um, if you notice all the master's name, Buddha, Krishna, Yogananda, uh, Sai Baba, Mir Baba, 
and even Jesus' name was Yahuwah. His real name was Yahuwah. So we will say it's Yeshua or Yeshua. Right. Now I have the ah sound. Well, Adam, they found that they, when you run that ah sound through an oscillator, it makes the Siriyantra symbol, the Hindu symbol of God, the 27 interlaced triangles. Doesn't kind of look like it. Well, maybe if I hold it, it looks like now. It makes it each and every time. So the sound of ah, and you know, excuse my French, but when most people have some type of orgasm, they ah, there's some type of ah sound. Oh, right. The ah sound is the sound of creation itself. So, yeah, I mean, and then, you know, the Mozart effect is about using uh, music, uh, Gregorian chants to create and induce an alpha or theta state where we can examine creativity and things like that. And then uh, neuroscience uh, in Sedona, neuromagic in Sedona, using a, a $40,000 software program, analyze my voice. And, uh, and the tones, and it showed that my tones, the pure tones that come through me and on my MP3 files, it, um, that it produces the right ratio of alpha, delta, beta, and theta waves. So people can sleep better at night and they have less anxiety. So, I mean, there's a real science. I mean, Greg Brain shows a, a video, a sonogram of three Chinese healers using sound waves and um, Qigong to uh, dissolve a golf, ball, a golf ball sized tumor in 30 minutes. And there was another article in the New York Times a few years ago about using sound waves to restore the structures of blood cells. So, and Edgar Casey, the famous psychic said that sound, sound would be the healing modality of the future. So, I mean, it's definitely powerful. When re, 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 retracing a little bit of what you said before in terms of at that conference that you had and, and you were able to resonate a certain vibration or sound that was creating a sense of healing or a sense of peace. Um, was there a certain frequency or hertz that it was, or was it measured at? Yeah, it's, uh, whatever, what comes through me is usually A sharp. It's um, 396 hertz, that's what it comes through at. And what chakra does that resonate with? Is that the is that third eye? It's the third eye, yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah very interesting. So, I mean, I, you know, I listen to Solfregio, I don't know if I'm pronouncing it correctly, the frequencies. Yeah every morning uh, and so, as i said earlier some of them test my my energy field um uh, but i could see them clearing up or working through what is what is your suggestion to people in terms of listening to certain frequencies which frequencies the host all seven or or specific based well on sure so um there's an app you can download up for your phone either for your iphone or your um your android it's called frequency generator and you just dial whatever frequency you want from zero to whatever sky's the limit. And I, I Bluetooth mine through my uh, vintage uh, hi-fi system. I have got Denon, Nakamichi, Mirage, old school vintage uh, hi-fi sub clips. And um, 40 hertz, and this is Dr. Joe Dispenza talks about 40 hertz. That's gamma. And that seems to be the most um, important frequency for awakening and meditation is 40 hertz. It's room, room, it's really. Yeah, slow. yeah. And then uh, 174 hertz is really powerful for regenerating the body. Uh, and then there's the uh, 432. Music's supposed to be based on 432 hertz. The music industry switched it to 440 for God knows what reason. But it, And then there's uh, 528. What's that? I guess to maybe create distortion. Just create distortion, yeah. And then uh, there's uh, 528, which is for love. And then the other one I recommend to people all the time is um, either 396 or 9963. Those are, um, 963 is really powerful for um, uh, higher states of consciousness as, as well. Yeah. And so, you know, I, I usually, in terms of working with tuning folks myself to some capacity, I recognize like where there's a specific ailment or a specific issue going on emotionally, I guess, working on that specific chakra energy field, or is it, I guess, just right. clearing each one assists in the whole process of, of the whole, you know, the, the parts are equal to the whole, or I, I wouldn't know how to verbalize that, but maybe. Yeah. So first of all, whatever hurt to use, find one that feels good to you. And I totally agree with Jonathan Goldman, who is probably the most well-known sound healer on the planet. Uh, 
I got to pre uh, present with him in Sedona back in 07. And I agree it's more about intent. You know, what is your intent behind the frequency? What is the intent, you know, behind the sound? And then the sound and the sound is consciousness itself. And so it, it understands your intent. Okay. But yeah, I mean, there, there's people that will say, well, this is for this chakra. This is for this chakra. Okay. And those are, those are true to a degree. I just think it's more about intent than anything else. Okay. I guess what, what resonates with someone. What, or what resonates. Because also there's people that will listen to the 963 hertz and they're too sensitive because it's too high. It's too high for their, their hearing you know, but I, I always recommend find a hurt, but in general, most sounds, most frequencies, atoms, uh, will clear most things. Okay. Interesting. Uh, I'm, I'm interested in the subject of past life regression and past lives, uh, in general, I've had an experience myself. I do a little healing work and having worked with client, one of the clients or a couple of them, they, they said, I remember you. And I said, from where? And they told me from the concentration camps as a doctor. And I had had, I had had Akashic record readings on those exact subjects of my specific physical ailments, emotional stuff that was going on. So it rang so true for me. And I was very interested in hearing a little bit about the subject of past life regressions in terms of what you do or what you've experienced. So, yeah, so um, I have a lot of experience with past life regressions. I've been doing them for 30, 30 some years now. Um, so I, I guess I should kind of uh, backtrack a little bit. Um, shortly after my NDE, uh, my other uh, friend, Toby, his mom, Patty Lou Fetter, she introduced me to um, Dick Sutpen. Dick Sutpen has trained um, almost everyone out there, including Brian Weiss, Dr. Brian Weiss, who wrote Many Lies, Many Masters. Uh, I trained with uh, the book he wrote. A long time ago back in the 80s <clears throat> maybe even the 70s was you were born again to be together which is about reincarnation and soulmates and so i i mean i just i became very fascinated with the idea of past lives reincarnation plus my narrative experience you know the, the the soul being eternal and knowing that you 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 are you are born again but you're born again in in the physical um and and she introduced me to um Joe Albiani and Jerry Bowman. Joe Albiani was an attorney out of Boston. Jerry Bowman was a Vietnam vet who was a trans channel. Uh, Jerry Bowman channeled um, John, John from the Bible, the John the Apostle. Now you may not have heard of uh, Jerry Bowman, but many of us have heard of Sherry McCle uh, Shirley McLean. Yeah, yeah. Shirley McLean's channel was Kevin Ryer, Kevin Ryerson. Kevin cha also channeled John. And um, John, as I was listening to Jerry Bowman channel John, uh, I found that John started to speak to me. And he would say things like, we never use the truth to be right. We never use the truth to make others wrong. We never use the truth to score points for ego. We never use the truth to belittle others. He would say things, you know, like um, a master is not a master because he himself says so. A master is called master because of those who witness him say that he is master um and he, he always said the king of the king of god is within you why do you seek anything else when you know you know when you're 18 19 years old and there's too many blondes there's too many brunettes there's nature boy rick flair woo you know there's all these there's college football there's all these things that most 18 to 20 somethings find you know exciting uh and so um not, I, not only was I receiving all this information from, you know, and of course, 30, some, 40, 30, 40 years later, you wish you kind of would have listened a little bit more. Uh, John, in a sense, returned to me in the last year or two. So talking to me about things. And of course, along that with Dick Sutphin, I almost became obsessed with reincarnation and past lives. And so from uh, 91, 92, 93, 94, four years in a row, I trained with Dick Sutphin and his uh, wife at the time, Tara, on how to do past life regressions. And I started doing them. I, I'm fortunate that when you were 21, 22 years old, I don't think very many people took me seriously, which is why I started doing hypnosis shows because I could get away with doing hypnosis shows and going sleep and making people do, you know, quote, funny, strange things. But yeah, right. 
and then it hasn't been the last few years where I, you know they say in china you don't you're not an adult till you're 50 anyway so um <clears throat> people have taken me more seriously as yeah. doing past life regressions and you know uh, when I first started doing this 30 years ago, but past lives are real. I mean, we know that in 553 AD, Carmen reincarnation removed from the Christian Bible, the Second Council of Constantinople, the Nicene uh, decree they they declared that reincarnation is heresy, uh, and people that believed in it were lunatics. Um, 325 AD, um, Roman Emperor Justine uh, cantonized certain Bibles, certain books from the Bible, and he removed about 14 to 20 of them, including the book of uh, Thomas Aquinas, the book of Mary, and the book of truth. All these books that were removed from the Bible put the power and presence of God within the individual, individual and, not, and not the church. But uh, we, I've had some, we've had many amazing breakthroughs, people getting lifelong blocks resolved because of past life regression. It's very real. Yeah, it's interesting the the fact that some people have a recall of specific things that have been passed from another life where other people are have amnesia to it, which I don't know if, whether it was Pluto or Socrates said that there's a specific type of amnesia necessary for us to to live in this life fully or right. presently. Yeah. But 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 just for some reason, I could speak for myself. I had recall of specific things, uh, like living in living. I lived in Germany. Uh, in, in 1987, I married a German woman. I spoke German fluent within five months, uh, and uh, it seemed like home to me. So that was in 1987, skipped the year 2010 or so. And then I had that reading done for myself, and it all made sense. So for myself and others, I'm sure people are experiencing certain traumas in this life or phobias that have nothing to do with this life, per se, in the, this physical body, but more the soul's experience from another life, as, as we're discussing. Yeah, I, but, but I'll give you an example of that, I, you know, uh, a client that couldn't conceive a child that no matter what they did, they couldn't try. Well, she went back to a lifetime, you know, in the 1800s, 1837, where she was forced to give up a child and, and leave it on the steps of a, of a church. So she, her unconscious pattern, energetic pattern, because it's all energy, energy doesn't die, it only transforms. And we have these energetic patterns that we carry with us from her other lifetimes, her body told her that if she has a child, she's going to have to give it up. So she associated at a subconscious level that having a child means it, losing it. So the body's going to do whatever it can to prevent it from having a child. Or you have another client who no matter, no, no matter what they did, they couldn't lose weight, lose weight. Well, what if they had three lifetimes in a row where there, was not, there wasn't food? And they had three lifetimes in a row where they... Uh, died of starvation so no matter what they eat there's their body at a subconscious level thinks there's not enough food and once you see the idea behind past life regression is that once you understand the cause you can change the effect right, right, right. and of course edgar casey always said wisdom erases karma so you're you know once you obtain that wisdom the karma is resolved you're loving and positive actions cancel out some of the neg negative ones yeah but yet yet people who when we're stuck in the ego you know we never have that desire to or understand the concept of going deeper and foregoing the real lesson that we're supposed to experience in in, in the life that we're, we're living um you're also a gifted uh, qigong healer and you use qigong to transmute energy or chi from the unseen realms to the physical realms. Um, maybe you could speak a little bit about that. I do Tai Chi. I mean, I do Tai Chi in the morning and I do my own form of Qigong, but maybe you could t touch upon that subject. Yeah, so um, Qigong has been around in China for, I've seen numbers between five and 10,000 years. 7,000 years seems to be the most common denominator. It, it is their medical system. They rarely go to medical doctors unless they absolutely have to, but their form of medicine is Qigong. It's based on energy meridians in the body. Qigong literally translates into cultivating life force. Um, in uh, 1999, I went and saw Bruce Francis in El Paso, Texas. I was going to undergraduate graduate school at uh, New, New Mexico State University in Las Cruces at the time. And um, I watched Bruce Francis with my own eyes, like you and I are watching each other. I watched Bruce throw people five to seven feet, 12 in a row with his mind. And they 
they smack the wall you know like star wars talks about the force yeah. and um of course i tell us people over and over again the the goal is not throwing people or you know telekinesis the goal is to show that energy is real that you can transform and influence the energy around you so uh i've i've practiced qigong since shortly after my nde um, um well i mean that's not right well, shortly after i got the phone call in 95 or 96 and i've been teaching it uh for seven or eight years now and in november of 2020 uh during covid uh, i was downloaded what i think you know, and i've you know I'm, i've not, never been to shaolin shaolin or tibet i mean and not in this lifetime anyway but and based on what other people have told me it's probably one of the most powerful breathing techniques on the planet right now i call it 12 12 breath method or um the yeah. blessed breath to awakening and um it's really profound and, and the, the breath has one goal and one goal only that's to awaken people and we've had people talk about how how it's almost insanely powerful and what and it's it's meant to be and um but qigong is it, it'll transform your life it reverses aging gets your telomeres to expand and grow gives you excuse me greater health yeah vitality all those things that we want especially when we you know uh get into our 50s and and things like that yeah maybe you could touch a little bit upon the uh powerful 12 breath method of energy awakening exercise what exactly it is so i guess in a nutshell you're basically doing 12 inhales but at each point you're stopping at like the solar plexus the heart the throat and the third eye it's also on my website it's anyone can watch the video for free on my website um but the idea is that in west in, in adam in western world we're usually taught to hold our breath to reach a certain point and then we exhale and some of the um tantric practices shamanic breath work uh vedic uh breathing exercises and what this is about is you really want to when you reach that point, Adam, of wanting to exhale, that you want to hold your breath and you want to breathe in even more. And you do that through various, you know, the four chakras, three inhales each chakra, four times three is 12. But it's all about holding your breath. It's, I mean, I'm not trying to get anyone to be um, David Blaine, uh, but the longer you hold your breath, the more energized and awake in your cells become. Yeah. I do the Wim Hof breath. Very interesting. I started off holding my breath for a minute and 10. Now I'm up to 10, nine minutes or so holding with five. Now minutes. you're getting into, you're getting into seal training stuff there. Yeah. I'm able to do that. I'm able to hold it for after 50, five minutes of deep breathing and then I'll hold it, for, you know, for nine minutes or so. And then I definitely feel, uh, I feel very strong for it. Push-ups, pull-ups, all that other stuff. So, yeah, like the, I mean, from Christianity, Christian mysticism to the shamans, to uh, aboriginals, all, all across the board, they all talk about breath being spirit. Yeah. Breath is your, is your connection to spirit. The only thing I, the thing I find interesting is, is the fact is that when we go up this road or this path, naturally of spirituality, of Qigong, of breathing, of the things you, you, you mentor and teach and discuss, you, you find yourself more lonely and more isolated because you somehow find yourself alone on the mountain, so to speak. <laughs> If I was at the top of the mountain, I probably wouldn't be in a body, but we, we still got a ways to go. <laughs> no, no, I, I understand. I'm just the concept of, of growing know. makes you more unique and and different. And right. and in, in, in this earthly plane, forming relationships becomes much more difficult when other people are not on the same path and trying to instill or evolve. Use, yeah. Yeah, so I, the breathing technique is very powerful, and it's on it's on my website. Yeah, okay, I'll share yeah. I'll share that. Yeah. Um, by the way, just maybe you could just mention your website, and this way I'll post I'll put it in the description anyway. Yeah, I'll do that. Um, I'm being reminded of a story I should tell. Uh, my website is mark m a r k dash patterson dot com, 
mark-patterson.com. If you don't include the dash, you're going to get a, a well-known, uh, famous jeweler in New York City. So you got to include the dash. Well, you both shine, so. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so anyway, um, I got to tell a story about Synchro Destiny, and, and because this is important to understand that people, we are supported, that we are guided. Um, back in the 90s when I was in Charleston the first time, I worked at 82 Queen restaurant still there and uh, I was watching the videotapes uh, The Flower of Life with Drone Below Melchizedek which is about sound geometry the mathematics of the planet um, the Fibonacci sequel the, the Fibonacci spiral the phi ratio uh, all these things and I was completely mesmerized by it and um, so Adam, this guy comes into our restaurant for five nights in a row and every night he, he ends up in my section which is impossible to be in with in the first because every night you're usually in a different section. There's 12, there's 12 dining sections to 82 Queen. And um, the last night that he's there, uh, I hear this voice, this angel come to me and say, we need you to talk to him about the videotapes you're watching. I'm just like, no. <laughs> you know? I mean, we have an hour and a half wait. I have six tables. I'm in the weeds. You know, I'm just like, no, it's not going to happen. I don't have time for this crap, you know? And so um, they go, no, we really need you to do this. I'm just like, so I go to leave the table. Adam, I was physically pushed back in front of the table by an unseen force. And they were like, we need you to do this. And so I look at him and I go, what am I going to ask this guy? You know, I, so I said, hey, you are you a mathematics professor? I mean, what am I going to ask this guy, right? He looks at me and goes, Mark, what did you really want to ask me? <laughs> and I'm like, well, I'm watching these videotapes about the pyramids, the Sphinx, ge geometry. He goes, Drunvalo Melchizedek, where did you get those videotapes? I have to have these videotapes. And I found his name was um, Roger and his son was Sean. The Sean was, we were, we, Sean and I are the same age. I go, well, Roger, the tapes aren't mine. They belong to someone else, but I'll be, I'll call her tomorrow because it's obviously, you know, late at night, but I'll call her tomorrow and see if I can give them to you. So I call Rosemary the next day and they go, hey, this guy is adamant that the tapes belong to him. He, he really wants these videotapes. Is it okay if I give them to him? And she goes, yeah, sure. Well, you know, why not? Um, so I meet him the next day, give him the videotapes. Don't hear anything from this guy. Never hear anything from this guy. Three or four months pass. I go to work one morning and the same voice that told me to give him the video, talk to him about the videotapes comes back and goes, they go back and the female voice goes, Mark, we need you to go to your manager now and tell her that you need to leave. It, she, they're like, it, it'll be okay. I'm like, I just got here. You know what? I was supposed to work. They're expecting me to work. And they go, no, just tell her, just tell her, just tell her you need to leave. So I go, uh, Missy, your name was Missy. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm not, I just said, I'm not feeling well. Is it okay if I stay home, if I go home? She goes, yeah, I guess it's okay, go home. So the voice comes back to me and, they, and goes, we need you to go directly to your house. Please do not stop anywhere on the way. So it takes me a good 20, 25 minutes from 82 Queen to where I was living at the time. So Adam, as I open the door, the phone rings. It's Roger calling me from France. He says, how would you like to work with Trunvalo and Melchizedek in person? I'm like, of course I do. What do you know? What, what's this about? What's going on? You know, where's it at? And how much do I need to pay? He says, everything's been paid for. Thank you for the videotapes. So I got to spend about 10 days with Trunvalo, working with him with about, I don't know, there's probably about 60 or 75 other people. When he was actually still teaching the Flower Life workshops and they were 10 or 12 hours a day. And I tell this story because it really does show that uh, we are guided, you know, the angels are real, the guides are real and they're, and they want to, to assist us, you know, and that's just try, but you got to trust because I really think that in life was not meant to be a struggle. I think we resist with being who we really are and that everything in life becomes a re a reflection of that resistance. You know, Jesus was in the scene and you know, one of the seven truths of these scenes was that everything in life is a reflection of what's going on within with you. And, you know, can you use the 
this world as your mirror to learn to see yourself in all people, all things, and all places. Because there's really no out there. You know, that's why Jesus said, even if you hurt the least of your brother and you're hurting me, you know, that's the oneness. We are one. We are the collective, the Godship, the sonship. Yeah, we're all one. How did you trust that inner voice? And when you heard that inner voice, I know you heard it over numerous times through your life. Was it a voice? Was it a vision? Well, when they pushed me back, when, when there was an unseen influence that pushes you back in front of a table, you kind of take a hint that you probably might want to listen to what they're saying. And that's happening. I mean, I, I remember the first time I went to Egypt in 07, and they took me to the um, the the room of Sekhmet. Sekhmet is the goddess of personal power, and I I didn't know what to expect. But I kind of walked in there real nonchalantly, you know, pretty laid back. And uh, Sekhmet, the energy of Sekhmet, threw me right out of my keister. I mean, slammed me right in my butt, you know, as a way to, you know, have some humility and respect. So kind of gets your attention. Well, I mean, I think people are obviously in, in the direction of opening up, ascending to different levels of consciousness as we speak now, specifically people who are interested in the subjects that we're talking about and what's been spoken about, about NDEs and past lives. But there are people who remain open and don't have the same experiences as other people. And for example, your near-death experience has placed you in this position to inspire and to teach and to, to grow and to share your story. Um, I mean, there are people who maybe are alerted, but just don't listen and they don't take heed to what they're being told. What do you think the best way for a person to do that is to receive? What are the consequences? Right. Right. You know? Yeah. Yeah. We either, we, we heard to, we are here to evolve. Yes. You know, evolve is the only word that has the word evolve is the only word in the English dictionary that has the word love in it. And we can either evolve through grace or evolve through hardship. But because of the matrix of fear, control, uh, all the programming that we we go through, uh, we, we tend, you know, Mike, Michael Beckwith uh, from The Secret always says, most people squander their lives because of resistance. Yeah. You know? it's, it's funny because, you know, you go, I find myself going through cycl cyclical patterns like everyone oh, yeah. else and revisiting the same themes and, and conflicts that have once existed. Specifically now I'm writing a book and bringing back the traumas of childhood, uh, putting me exactly in the place of where I left it off without really resolving it because I really never Im used the imagery again or the, the dialogue that I once experienced. And so I'm actually on a cellular level feeling this burning and itching coming out of my skin for the last month since I've been writing. Like, so I, for, for, for a specific thing like that, how would a person resolve that? How would a person not resolve it, but do you allow the feelings to arise, not judge them? Yeah. It's important. It's important to feel your feelings. It's never good to suppress them. It's important to honor and feel your feelings and realize that, you know, this is what you're experiencing. Um, I, I think that you have to really learn to appreciate yourself. You have to learn to have compassion for yourself. You have to learn to not be so critical of yourself because the reality is, is that you're going to make mistakes. You're going to drink that bottle of wine. You're going to have those one night stands. You're going to have bad relationships. You're going to make mistakes. But Adam, if you and I leave for Jamaica at the same time and I or you arrived two hours after I did, you didn't fail Jamaica. You just arrived at a different time than I did. And there's no, you know, my dad, who was the holy roller, the Jesus zealot, uh, you know, a couple months after he passed away, he came to me in a dream. And first he acknowledged that I was right, that reincarnation and past lives are real. But then he said something, he said one of the most profound things I've ever heard. And I've, I mean, I've, I went and saw Ellie Bazell, the Holocaust survivor, Nobel Peace Prize winning author. I've listened to Greg Braden, Wayne Dyer. I've, I've I've seen Chopra a few times, but my dad looked at me and goes, Mark, and this is my dreams. It's a couple months after he passed away. So when he was still alive, he said, Mark, you seem to be in this race to be perfect. You might want to get out of a race that has no finish line. Wow. Yeah. It's that, that's a wow, you know, and uh, for him, especially for him to say something like that, because he thought all this stuff I was doing was 
nonsense, but that's a pretty profound statement. And the, you know, Abraham Hicks, Abraham Hicks talks about this over and over again. You're never going to get it. You're never going to get it. You're never going to get it. Enjoy the process. Enjoy the process. But we get into trouble, Adam, is what we keep saying. Our life should be this way when it's not. Yeah, yeah. Our life should be this way when it's not. You have to really learn to accept your life exactly the way it is. And it's because Psalm 113, Psalm 139, 16 says, every day of my life, every moment, every deed, every action was recorded in your book before a single one had taken place. Your life is the way that it is because you planned it this way. Yeah. Your life is the way it is because you designed it this way. We choose our parents. We choose our circumstances. We choose experiences. We tend to incarnate with about 20 to 30 people that are called our soul family. And then we also have parallel lives. You can fit your over soul can incarnate with a, into about four or five different beings at the same time. Now, I've only talked about this the last few years because they keep telling me my dreams that the rock star Sammy Hagar is one of my parallel lives. Right. We've never met. I've never spoke with him before. I just know that I've been told that over and over again. And I think uh, his song, um, When Love Comes Walking In, is about making contact with aliens. I do know that he does believe in uh, ETs. But, um, but I mean, I, another thing is, we make, you don't know what your contract, there's going to be people, there are people that get divine guidance every day. They get messages every day. That's part of who they are. That's part of their contract. Those are people that will get messages here and there. But ultimately, it's about, you know, it's it's about raising your vibration, raising your energy, raising your consciousness, your awareness, so you can receive those messages. Yeah. And that's what, it, you know, stop feeling sorry for yourself. Very interesting. The, you know, I guess it's the concept of it's more about the the journey rather than the destiny of, of, right. of, of what you you know, yeah. allotted to. Um, yeah, in terms of uh, alien connections, uh, you know, it's interesting you hear people who've had the near-death experiences and then be in contact with galactic beings that are guiding them or probably have guided them throughout their, their life, in this life and others. I saw a ship myself about two years ago floating over the, over the beach, and then a blue orb exploded over my car uh, driving mm. on, on the parkway during the winter, which I thought obviously wasn't a Roman candle and. Uh, and I'm a believer myself. I've had numerous dreams. Of yeah, that. I've had encounters since, ever since I was a kid. And, you know, there are galactics out there that really want us to evolve. And there's, unfortunately, there's other uh, beings out there that want to see us press buttons. But it seems to be right now, the plan is that why Earth is so important right now, why we have millions of beings lined up to incarnate here at this time is because as we make this shift into a higher dimensional consciousness, it is going to create a chain reaction, a domino effect where thousands and thousands of galaxies throughout everywhere, throughout all time and space will also have this awakening, but it starts here on the planet Earth. It's going to be like a domino effect. It's going to be really amazing. And it does seem to be unfolding. In fact, it could, it seems to be starting to unfold uh, towards the end of this year, first or next year, but, you know, we'll see. We got, we got a ways to go. Some bumps in the road coming. Sure. I think yeah. it's Thank you, Adam. Um, so I encourage you all to love yourself. And that God's presence, whatever you think of it, is within you right here, right now, today. It is here now. Okay. Uh, my website is mark-patterson.com. You can follow me on Instagram at, at Sedona Mark Patterson. Adam, thank you. Thank you. I hope we'll stay in touch. I really enjoyed it. Thank we you. We will. Thank you.